You are a what? prolific writer, ma'am, and you write in a way that feels as though you are specifically centering the, the needs of black readers, black readers of a variety of ages, definitely the youth. But I've, as I was saying earlier, whenever it comes to young adult writers who are writing for black people, I feel like I could, no matter what my age, I could still find so much in those writings that are really for me. Let's talk about your journey. Let's talk about the fact that you have been able to basically sweep up all the, the awards out there like infinity rings <laughs> and what it means for someone like you right now in an era where banning books is the popular thing to do. Talk to us, E.B. Zaboy. How did you get your start on this path? Oh, man, you know, I've been you said I, I am pro prolific, but this started 20 years ago. I've been writing mm. since college. And while in college, I was writing for my newspaper. I was writing poems for the little, you know, Friday night open mics, spoken word poems. I was writing short stories for a creative writing class. So I just remember a time when I was writing everything and that never stopped. And in the process mm. of becoming a writer, I was introduced to other writers who were um, many writers who pa have since passed away, like Octavia Butler and Toni Morrison, I met in real life. Um, some mentors like Edwidge Danticat, who is also Haitian. And I knew early on that uh, writing for a living is a possibility for me. Mm. And mostly because of Edwidge Danticat, who was writing about Haiti and specifically her book that was on Oprah's book club in 1998 was about my mother's hometown. And that was a light bulb moment for me because of course, you know uh, how the media treats Haiti, um, especially in the eighties and nineties when I was growing up and to That's see right. it in a novel that was celebrated by Oprah Winfrey herself. I said, I can do that. I can write about the specificity of my life and the specificity of black people in different, you know, in, in my corner of New York at the time, and it could mm. be celebrated. And my start was really in the spoken word movement. Some people say, you know, they were reading a lot, but I was listening to my peers uh, tell mm. their stories on the stage and they got feedback in real time. And that was so incredibly um, vital to my the start of me being a writer. And you don't, you're not just writing about, I mean, because all of us could write about a whole host of things. You are, you have a very particular approach. And it, again, I want to look specifically at the people remember, because when I first got my hands on this book, I was like, oh, this is a, it's a beautiful image. And if you all, you look it up right now, it's the people remember, uh, illustrated by Love is Wise. And it's a beautiful book. And I, I wasn't expecting an almost entire multi-page poem that literally is taking us through the experience of, of being in our, our, our original villages and our original spaces on continent throughout the continent of Africa, going through this sojourn and you describe it in ways that makes it crystal clear to me. Oh, this is the middle passage. Oh, this is the walk that we had to go through from our villages to the waters. But as I'm reading this to my nine-year-old with my nine-year-old, if I was reading this to my six-year-old niece or nephew, it is in language that makes perfect sense to them. And it is completely age appropriate. And I'm wondering how you are able, what is, how do you do that? Right? Like, how do you take these incredibly complex issues and talk about them in ways that make perfect sense to a six-year-old or to a 60-year-old? And at the same time, it's filled with so much compassion for who we are and what we have gone through. Talk with us about how you're able to engage in that part of the process. Thank you so much for recognizing that. And I'm always going to keep going back to the spoken word movement and how that is my foundation, because it's not just the spoken word movement. It was my entry into our oral tradition. And I wow. lean heavily in our oral tradition. And yeah. in my career in my industry were often asked, well, what was your favorite as a children's book writer? What was your favorite book as a child? I had none because I wasn't reading as a child um, mm -hmm. because of the book deserts I grew up in. Um, I was Haitian immigrant, my mother, single mother for a time, and she was going to school and working hard. And there were no bookstores in Bushwick, Brooklyn, where I grew up. Um, and I immigrated when I was four. So we moved to Bushwick because it was affordable. And if you know New York City in the 80s and 90s, plenty of neighborhoods were just deserts in general. Mm -hmm. And libraries were incredibly underfunded. I remember mm -hmm. just empty shelves in the library. And it wasn't always safe for a little girl to sit in, li in the library on her own. And my mother just did not have the time to 
take me to the library, return books. And and when we did go to the library, it, I know she was anxious about those late fees. And so mm. it was just like, we can't do it. You know, it, 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 there was so much involved in the act of going to the library. And some of us, um, so many of us writers talk about that being a huge part of their childhood. But I want yeah. to acknowledge immigrant communities, working class and low income communities where books are not part of the home culture. And mm. I want to really, really strongly reinforce that just because I was without books doesn't mean I was without stories. Now we mm. told stories uh, and Haiti, you know, hey, we were Haitian immigrants. So there was always stories about life back home and the way things were coupled with, we watched a lot of news. Like I loved the six o'clock news growing up. And oh, again, you could have been in my know, house. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause we could only watch different world and Cosby show. But when the news came on, we could also watch, watch the news the if my news. parents were watching. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and my mother was very politically active and opinionated. She was a um, just like yourself, she had, um, she was on a radio. She was a news reporter on the radio. Wow. And I have photos of her um, in an old new radio station back in Haiti. So my mother is very vocal and opinionated. So I grew up with those stories, stories of how things mm -hmm. were corruption in Haiti, how the news is misrepresenting Haiti. There was always conversation with the adults coming in and out. And I was always the little girl, just like, you know, having my ear listening to a grown folks conversation. So for the young people and households out there, it's to not, you know, not be ashamed if you don't have a grand home library. The, mm. I think the most important thing that you could do is constantly tell stories about what it was like wow. when we were growing up. Tell stories of your relatives, tell tell stories of your day, because that is also storytelling. And most people like to think that listening to audiobooks is not reading, but listening to audiobooks is listening to story, therefore reading. Listening mm -hmm. to stories is reading. Stories. I like to just put the power on stories. Because if I talk about books, we'd have into we'd have to get into the publishing industry and the bookmaking business. <laughs> and that's a whole oh, well can can we do that? I don't you know I, I don't want to dip too much into your bag. I'm just saying I I do want to however no, point out no. highlight this point that you just referenced the idea that not having books doesn't mean you don't have stories. And for people who have oral traditions as a very vibrant part of who we are, and I, and I always say that we had oral traditions and we had print traditions. We had both people. There were some communities where the oral tradition was more prevalent. There were other communities where a written tradition was also a vibrant part of the community. But the idea I think you're hitting at is is the telling of the story, the telling of the tale, the changing and the inflection of the voices uh, when you're taking on different characters, the ability to create in one's mind the, the first set of movies, right? Like we know we go into a movie theater and we see all of this production for us, but the first set of movies were our imagination and the stories that we could paint by listening to others who were talking about these concepts. And the idea that we have power in our stories and that that fueled you through the uh, spoken word movement. I love that. Shout out to Love Jones without the toxicity. Uh, I love that. <laughs> I love that era. I was I was heavy into the spoken word era. But I think this is so important that we we don't just value our written down stories. I love that you are highlighting for us that we have a variety of conversations that are storytelling appropriate, a variety of experiences rather, that are storytelling appropriate that I think we sometimes forget. So, so thank you for that. You, you talked about the underfunded libraries. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the book publishing space. And I just got to ask you, how does it, are, are any of your books currently banned anywhere in the nation? Absolutely. Uh, my first book, American Street, um, which is about a Haitian girl's immigrant experience in Detroit is banned. Uh, mm. Black Enough, um, which features uh, 16 other uh, Black writers. I, I believe you had Jason Reynolds on your show. He's featured That's right. here, uh, is banned in a district. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's it. Um, there are other books that are definitely being banned by uh, Black authors, non-Black authors. And if they're non-Black, it's usually LGBTQ themed mm. books. But mm. there is a huge problem right now. And I want to say that just as much as um, a book, there are books being banned, but there are just as many books being celebrated in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm traveling to Texas. Texas is the number one state that is banning books right now. And I'll be in Texas by, by May, I'll be in Texas three times. And the tech, some of the Texas educators are like, that's that district and that's that district, but that's not us. Wow. Uh, but 
the districts that are banning books are making the most noise. And that's part of our culture, right? We don't hear the good stories. And mm. I want to say that I was just at the Texas Council of Teachers of English <laughs> Language Arts, huh. which is a, you know, a, just a organization um, for teachers of English. And they're the ones who are, have you know, who have the books in their classrooms. They, you know, they had me there. They had Jerry Craft, who wrote New Kid, a graphic novel, whose books wow. were, were banned as well. Uh, it, it's It's ridiculous. It really is the reasons that they are banning books. Uh, but there are teachers and librarians who are pushing back. There are districts where people of color reside and mm. they're still, they still have access to these books. So it's par for the course. It's just so interesting. June of 2020, my book hit the uh, bestseller list. All these black books were hitting the bestseller list after the wow. unfortunate uh, murder of George Floyd. You know, everybody was buying all the black books. And I remember thinking, I'm like, you know what? You know, <laughs> if I know America the way I think I do, something's a coming, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Something's a brewing. And lo and behold, my books were banned at the end of 2021, just a year later. You know, wow. we're buying the books and then all of a sudden other people are just like, no, <laughs> we don't want you, your books anymore. This is this is fascinating to me because I, I feel as though one thing, if I know America, one thing that America often forgets is that the more you try to stop something, the more you push up against something, the more you're going to have people who are absolutely going to clamor for it. We saw it with prohibition. We've seen it with cannabis. We see it in a whole variety of areas. And it feels like the more we have people shouting about how many of these books should not be in classrooms, is there a resurgence on the other side? Are you seeing, I know perhaps it's not necessarily being registered in terms of best-selling books versus not. I mean, you've done wonderfully well, even in, in spite of the bans, but are you seeing that the clamoring for content, like the content that you're putting out, is that making a, as big of an impact as is uh, the district that is extraordinarily loud? You know, we, but for you telling us this, I would have thought the entirety of Texas was just a blanket book banned space, but it sounds like even within that very uh, politicized arena, we are seeing that there are districts that are standing up and, and sta standing for what is right. Are you seeing that audiences are also able to differentiate and are they voting with their pocket books, I guess is the question. So that's the myth, right? When a book gets publicized as being a banned book, um, some people think it drives up sales. That's not necessarily always true uh, mm. because there are books for the children's book industry. We rely on school and libraries to make huge purchases. If um, and you right. won't even if you don't see my books or uh, you know some other authors' books on the bestseller list. Uh, there are districts buying up books and those sales mm -hmm. don't show up in a visible way. They buying it directly from the publisher or other retailers and they'll buy 5,000 copies in one shot. Wow. So if an entire district bans your book, that's like a, a huge amount of books that you're not selling, right? Mm. So it does affect our pockets. You Individual sales are good, but sometimes buying units for a district for a number right. of for the entire school and I'm not saying a, a a a classroom or a school a school district puts it on their curriculum meaning mm. their the school will have a budget for the books to be taught in the class every single year once wow. they ban that that's a huge number of sales that we're not receiving so it does, they are making an impact. They are making a huge mm. impact. Even if a district um, doesn't ban your book, they'll hem and haw about it. They'll right. second guess it. And maybe they'll remove it from the curriculum, but not ban it. Removing from a curriculum means, yes, they're not buying the books anymore. So it mm. is like a gradation of just like, you ban it, you know, or you don't put it on the curriculum, or maybe mm. you don't buy as many for your library shelves. It does create a ripple effect where it does hurts our pockets, but most importantly, it does not allow those kids who need these stories the most to have That's access right. to them. And right. in my industry, sometimes um, some authors come in and say, well, we're writing because we did not see these books when we were growing up. I don't like to say that because it erases those Black authors who are writing for children in the 70s or 80s. And there were mm. a good amount, 
right? Mm. It's just that I didn't have access to it. You know, my cat, my Catholic school teachers, <laughs> Sister Mary and them were not handing <laughs> me um, a Walter Dean Myers book. They wasn't, right. they weren't hiring me, Rosa um, Guy or Virginia Hamilton books. So those books existed just like my books will exist. But if your child, you know, if a black child or any child is in a district where it's banned or it's removed from the curriculum, mm. they don't know exists. And they're going to 20 years later, they're writing books. Oh, I grew up. I didn't have these books when I was a child. You right. just didn't have access to them. Right. No, your parents had you in an all white school and that's right. why you didn't have the or <laughs> your, your parents. They didn't right. supplement the library as perhaps they may have been able to um, if right. you were in one of these districts. But and that's one blow that authors like like yourself are facing but then it feels like as i'm thinking about the publishing industry generally there's a whole additional layer of frustration well i'm going to call it frustration there's an additional set of mountains that black authors have to climb particularly when you are writing for young audiences talked with us about some of the before you even get to the part of having a book that can be banned what are some of the challenges that you and other authors find that you're facing when it comes to trying to navigate this industry because if the teachers are 80 percent white women i would imagine the publishers might also be similarly situated what is that like for you the teaching um population is much more diverse than the editorial public <laughs> population mm -hmm. in publishing damn <laughs> like, wait a minute so you mean the 80 percent of white teachers that's more diverse of an industry than the publishing absolutely industry? i i hesitate to quote any numbers but i can name maybe i can name the amount of black women editors in my industry on both hands, you know, wow. and that's five big, and hundreds of editors, right? I think the mm. percentage is very small. Um, I, there are very few uh, literary, black women, literary agents. So mm. my, it's not a frustration. It's something I'm learning to contend with is that in there's publishing the book, then there you're dealing with an editor who has to edit your book, your my very black content. And then right. there's my literary agent who has to advocate for it. And they get a, a commission and they have to understand what you're doing and who you are and what you all about in order mm. to promote you, you know, sell you your product to the publisher. And the publisher has to understand you and what you're all about so they can promote you to the wider, the, the consumer. So there yeah. are layers of entry. It took me a very long time to get into publishing because I was writing from a very niche space. I'm Gen mm -hmm. X. I grew up on hip hop. I'm Haitian. I love sci-fi. There are all these intersectionalities of my existence that I was writing from and very the very white world of publishing was like what are you who are you we can't market right. this i was first right. writing speculative fiction um i studied with butler i was trying to write sci-fi i was writing fantasy based on vodou haitian and, and y'all by butler she means the octavia butler just octavia in butler case you didn't know i just <laughs> Just sneak right. that on in there. Let's just make it plain. <laughs> right. Um, so you're studying with these folks and you're writing speculative fiction and, and you're having to present this work and this body of work to people who don't necessarily understand you, nor do they understand your organic audience. But it's not just your organic audience. They don't even understand, I would imagine, how to cross promote you to other audiences because no writer is just good for their own audience. I mean, there are, I, I take things from different from writers from a variety of different backgrounds on a regular basis. So the level of hurdles that you have to overcome just seems for many of us, it almost seems insurmountable. Yeah, I, as I said, I was writing in college. I did not become traditionally published with a novel and I've got short stories published here and there until I was 39 and that's late. That's the same age as wow. Toni Morrison granted, um, but that's mm. late and that was, and I think I do believe that that was because of a sea change in publishing where um, there was a, a Twitter, this is where Twitter was excellent, where people came to social media and said, we need diverse books. Uh, the late Walter mm. D. Myers wrote an a op-ed in the New York Times saying, where are the children of color? in books and that mm. you know and that wasn't the first that was the, maybe like the second or third time he'd written something like that and it was the publishers scrambling like yo where are they oh we didn't publish it 
Find me a black, find me a black book writer. <laughs> Get me a black over here quickly. <laughs> Wait, Evie, do you have to go? We're at the end of our, our segment. Do you have to go? If, if so, I'll, I'm definitely already planning well, to bring you back because I need to talk about This is one of the best Jones. interviews I've ever had. You're asking poignant Yay! questions that I don't get to answer. <laughs> I don't get to talk about these things. Thank you so much, Lorene. Well, I'm glad to hear you.